Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, Boss fired me because I once said to a coworker that I wanted to leave. I ruined everything she had. Since I'm still in school, I accepted a position at an unnamed type of bakery. Despite having bread in its moniker, the establishment also sells expensive salads and sandwiches. I had a boss there for about a year who went by the moniker of Betty, obviously not her true name. Betty and I had no relationship at all because she had an affair with him and threatened to tell his wife if he didn't leave she was able to convince the former general manager to resign. She received a promotion after he abruptly quit the workplace. Although I didn't like her, I must admit the commitment required to run a little convenience shop that way. She would do things that would irritate me when I first started working there, despite the fact that I was respectful to her. For instance, after cleaning every site that I was employed to, she would rush out of the manager's office, yelling, why aren't you working? After I had relaxed for perhaps five minutes. Naturally, I did my job, and as a cashier, if no one was there to assist, I had nothing to do. I would inform her of that. She would stare at me before accidentally spilling a whole pot of freshly brewed coffee onto my just mopped floor, leaving it for me to clean. I, therefore, quickly figured out to constantly appear busy. She began reducing my hours as soon as she understood that I wasn't going to kneel and kiss the ground that she walked on. The politics of promotions and pay hikes at the business were similar to those in Game of Thrones. Her buddies were all managers, and they bullied the rest of us. She had hardly even started. In case corporate chose to verify her hours, she would drive to my work clock. She was, therefore, essentially stealing time. A little piece of paper with your timestamp was printed off when you checked in. She would simply drop them off on the ground and leave the cleanup to me. Normally, I would grab them and put them in my pocket. As a result, I discovered Betty clock in and out receipts in my pocket at home. Later on, this is going to be significant. Did I mention, by the way, that she was incredibly racist? She was white, and the most of the staff members were POCs from my high school. She said to us as she left the office one day, When you're on the clock, I own you. She retracted her statement as we all turned to look at her and said, I didn't mean it like that. Later on, this will also be significant. As a result, I eventually grew tired of almost begging for hours, so I started working at my current position, but ultimately realized I only wanted to reduce my hours. They were hardly even a weekday. But suddenly, I started a new job. She made time for me daily, a single day during a whole week. Even when we were on somewhat friendly terms, she never did that. So I made it clear that I could not do this because I had a new job. I then went home and told my friend who was still employed there that I was leaving the next day. When he is cleaning at work, he has a horrible habit of turning on speaker on his phone. Naturally, Betty heard this. The following day when I enter, I make a polite show of saying, Thank you for the opportunity and blah blah blah. Betty waited until I finished speaking before interrupting. Oh, yes, I meant to tell you that. You're let go. I cursed at her because I was surprised and enraged. My mother taught me to respect women, but this effing huge, obese, hippo-looking bee made me furious. She's the kind of girl who believed binge eating was a character flaw. I was upset that I was let go before I could resign, so I left, but I didn't press the matter. Even though I'm only 18, I already had work at another job. Betty wasn't going to be a good reference for me anyway. If it hadn't been for the district manager, Ben, not his real name, 
texting me, I would have left it all alone. The penalty. I told him I was dismissed because he assumed that I was still employed there. He was surprised because I was a decent employee, so he questioned her decision to let me leave, and when I told him why, he became irate. He clarified that I was dismissed by her prior to quitting, and I consented. She had angered him by doing this, so he queried whether she had done anything else. I really just let it all out on him. He inquired whether anyone else would work with me after I told him about the racist statement. I omitted to explain that she gradually let go of employees and pushed them to resign, replacing them with members of her family and friends, which under corporate policy she was not permitted to do. Conflict of interest, I think. A few folks stated that they would claim they could when I asked everyone working that day whether they could, but one excelled above the rest. Andy, who is one of my coworkers, is confident that he'll become the next great YouTuber and is constantly on his phone or using audio recording for hours in the hopes of capturing some sort of funny clip. His stuff is absolutely cringe-worthy, in my opinion. But it turns out that he gives each recording a date and a time label. He discovered her making racial statements when he checked. I had a wonderful idea, so I decided to search Andy's records with my other fired or forced to resign coworkers. We discovered some fantastic instances where Betty said contentious things or was simply rude. For instance, when a guest once sneezed on the freshly baked pastries, a coworker informed her and she shrugged it off, saying, Nobody's going to notice. But for me, that wasn't enough. I tried to stay out of arguments, but if I find myself in one, I'm going to handle it. I discovered she was married when I searched her up on Facebook. Nobody was aware of this, so she effectively blackmailed the other manager when she had an affair with him while also being married and committing adultery. She was just an unpleasant old lady. So, I doubt anyone ever really cared enough to inquire. I discovered the former manager, Mark, on Facebook and learned that he and his wife were no longer together. It turns out that Betty continued to demand money from him even after he quit. When he didn't, she nonetheless told his wife, leading to their divorce and effectively leaving him to return to his parents' home. According to my study, extortion or blackmail in my state carries a third-degree sentence. This carries a victim fine of over $10,000 and a maximum jail sentence of seven years. So I explained my strategy to the previous manager. He promised to report her to the police, but I urged him to hold off until I had finished speaking. I would have a week, he promised me. So I went to see the district manager, Ben, and presented him with all of our proof. The audio and written testimonies from my former co-workers as well as others who were still employed there. When Betty checked in and left and then came back eight to ten hours later to check out, I also gave Ben the slips of paper. Ben thanked me for the info and I walked away. A few days later as I passed the store on foot, I saw that it was shut in the middle of the day. A man who was still employed there I texted him, and he told me everything. It turns out that Ben initially checked the surveillance footage to make sure that she was present for the entire time that she claimed to be. Unexpectedly, she wasn't. Ben made the decision to look into the store finances, since if she's faking her time, what else might she be stealing? He learned that she was robbing the shop of money. He only stated that she was, without going into detail about how she was, but it turned out that she was violating many health and safety regulations and utilized the money for her own repairs and other expenses. She was, therefore, quickly sacked along with every single one of her subordinates, leaving almost no one to manage the store. They stopped operations to mend stuff, since she didn't make it, and tidy the shop. She is now unemployed, and Mark told her husband that she had an extramarital affair. 
However, Mark worded it to make it look as though she was still. Because Betty is the sort to share everything on Facebook, her husband decides to divorce her as a result of her rage. She is pleading with someone to let her stay, but all of her relatives and friends have abandoned her. She was thus seeking employment while residing in her car. The company then chose to sue her for all of the money that she stole, in addition to all the repairs and missed revenue while the store is closed, which made that situation even worse. At that point, Mark decides to prosecute her for extortion, and she rushes to hire a lawyer. Betty's life is miserable. To pay for all the legal difficulties, she was forced to sell her car for a significant fraction of what it was actually worth, and Mark just revealed a little amount of her courtroom sobbing to me. I never was very close to him. Betty was living with her sister, who obviously despises her when I last heard from her. To think that if she had just let me resign, she could have prevented everything. You're very lucky to have an employee who just randomly records everything on his smartphone. That guy has dirt on literally everyone. Though his blogs may not be great, but he definitely has something more to offer in this situation. I think it's really admirable that you stood up for yourself. But in my opinion, it may have been better to get fired than to quit, since if you get fired, you can contest the decision with unemployment and receive benefits while you hunt for a new job. Depending on what you tell them, they might even decide not to fight it at all. Not that it matters in your circumstances, but being fired before you can leave is actually the best thing that can happen usually. Despite the fact that you already held the position, staying could have been perhaps more advantageous than leaving. And revenge might still be carried out in the same manner. But it's still your choice, and you did as you saw right, and most importantly, you definitely punished her. The next story is, HOA built a farm and hangars on my land while I was on vacation. I'm no HOA member. I want to share with you this crazy thing that happened during my short vacation to Europe. A little background that you should know before I start my story. I own a fairly decent-sized plot of land. It's so big that even when I'm at home, I don't get to visit some parts of it very often. The beginning. I returned to my hometown from a trip, wanting nothing more than to get into bed and sleep. I was very tired, and I had no energy to interact with anyone at all. As I approached my house, nothing seemed off to me from the start. I was happy to be home and didn't suspect a thing. I put my things in their places and decided to sit on my veranda for a while and enjoy the fresh air so that I could sleep better. I sat there for about 15 minutes and then saw someone else's cattle walking on my private property. Honestly, I thought it wasn't real, either because I didn't sleep very well or because I was already asleep and dreaming some surreal dream. I slowly approached these animals and realized that I was definitely awake. I started running around my land, and I saw that there were even more different animals behind my house. There were some gardens where nothing had grown yet, but it was clear that they had been cultivated and something had been planted there. And there were also hangers. There was also a sign that said it was sponsored by the local HOA, which I had never really heard of and was most certainly not a part of. I had a sudden burst of energy and ran to the HOA office. There I found out that during their last meeting, they had decided, without asking me or even any of my immediate neighbors who were also not part of the HOA but could at least contact me, to build a farm for the needy people from the HOA. They chose my plot because of its good size and because I wouldn't mind, since I don't use it and don't need it at all. They needed more, quote-unquote. As you can imagine, I was seething. My close friend, a lawyer, and I, after a carafe of tea and a lot of talking, came up with a plan. Step one. She made an invoice of how much the HOA owed me for the fact that they had already used my land. Step two. 
We sent an official statement to the HOA that we forbid them to continue. Step 3. Court. I was lucky that the media was interested in my case because the headlines, man returns from vacation and finds secret farm, are loud enough. It was quite easy in court, although the HOA tried to convince everyone that we were liars, but they had no evidence and we had everything we needed. The court ruled in our favor. We got even more than we wanted. After a while, I got a substantial amount of money and they restored my property back to its original condition. The next story is, Entitled company threatened to seize my property. I tracked down the owner and took her house. The story started almost a year ago. On my cell phone, I got a call from an unidentified number. It was an automated message telling me to contact an 888 number to have papers served on me. I was immediately aware that this might have been a collecting agency. I verified the phone number using Google. So I phoned this guy, and I must admit that it was a pretty fascinating conversation. When she answered, I gave her my contact information. She began listing debts from 1995 and beyond. After allowing her to continue, I informed her that identity theft exists and that I was ignorant of it. She freaked out as soon as I said it. She insisted that I would pay the loan even though she knew it to not be mine. I insisted on sending her a letter over and over, but she steadfastly declined. She replied that I had the right to pay the bill when I informed her that I was aware of my rights. She continued by threatening to place a lien on my huge pretty house in her exact words, which she had just described. Additionally, she claimed that she would place a lien on my Lexus, which she sees in my driveway. She also said that my front gate wouldn't prevent the foreclosure. Then she hung up. Now, I was wiser. She just obtained my information from public records before viewing Google Street View of my home. My best take is that she attempted to intimidate other people who are more intelligent than she was. It appeared to be a pretty questionable company up to this point, and when I called in, there were also phone recordings. I asked her if phone calls could be recorded for quality control reasons, and she said they were legal. She replied, of course. Thank you, I'll take that as my consent, I said. I would have simply shrugged this off and said that the woman was crazy, but the automated calls kept coming in, and I was unable to block them because I didn't know who was making them. The company appeared to be in Ohio when I googled it. There were a few red signs that made me think this, including the fact that the Ohio-based company's owner and attorney was under criminal investigation. I filed a grievance with the Attorney General of Ohio. The Federal Consumer Finance Bureau, which is supposed to be looking into those concerns, received my complaint as well, but they ignored me. I called this number three months later. When I called to see if I could receive additional information about the company through the IVR, I had thought that I might hit a few buttons. Well, that worked out. As soon as I pressed zero, a new firm name appeared. I found a ton of complaints when I googled that business. This led me to the company's New York location. With all of my information, I filed a complaint with the New York Attorney General. Over the following few weeks, I conducted a good deal of investigation and learned a ton of details, including the owner. I discovered that the owner's address, their Facebook account, etc., was the address where the business no longer received mail. Then I received another of those unidentified callers, but this time a different company is involved. You understand what I'm saying here, I'm sure. The parent company continues to call, despite the company's constant name changes. And I've had enough of this, finally. So I enlist the help of a private investigator, and they were pleased with the data I had so far. So I stood by and let him take care of it by himself. He then calls me back and claims that this business isn't even registered and is just run by one woman. She's not actually operating a legitimate business. I had filed a claim in New York by a process server, so my private eye began contacting her and the individuals on her friends list with friend requests. She first accepted the friend request from her buddies. Since she wrote that nonsense, my private investigator discovered that she had cheated on her boyfriend around a month ago. 
The private eye suggested that I try to get in touch with her lover, and if he can help us help her, I'll pay him $500. Well, we did that, and sure enough, after traveling for about 20 miles, we were able to serve this lady at her parents' residence. Since it's a tiny claims, it's just myself and this woman when I fly up to NY. Her mother is also present for whatever reason, but she's not speaking on her behalf. I tell the judge what I know about how she broke the law over the course of the month by making threats over the phone and violating debt collection laws. The judge gave me the maximum of $3,000 after learning about all the issues I had with these calls and how she masked her name on purpose. Small towns and villages in New York are restricted to $3,000. After the case, I overheard her mother saying, you better hope he doesn't take your house, in a loud whisper. This was constructed by your great-grandfather, using only his hands. I was considering. Well, lo and behold, I discovered the house had a second mortgage tied to it. Mmm, it would be sweet revenge if I could actually put a lien on the house, I thought. Due to the secondary mortgage's close to equal value to the house's worth, I would not ultimately receive the lien money if the house were to be sold. Then, I was thinking about how I would get the money from this woman. Five months later, my private investigator phones me to inform me that her home is going into foreclosure. I hire a proxy to place my offer. However, much like in other foreclosed cases, the bank purchases it as an REO. A few months later, I made the decision to submit a lowball offer to purchase the property. And the bank agreed to my proposal. My best opinion is that since it's a tiny town, finding the correct market for it was difficult. Perhaps you're asking, why I even purchased this home? Here's why, though. This B threatened to file a false lien against my home. That's right. She effed up, and I stole her whole house. It was entirely worthwhile. I had the money, and it didn't really cost me a lot. The house is in genuinely good shape, if quite compact. This is a retaliation at expert level. If we have the time and the money, this story is a great example of what you all could aspire to do. Many individuals were spared from being deceived and needlessly anxious because of you. I think you are a hero, a common folk hero, and it was unquestionably worthwhile for you to invest the time and energy that you did. I detest con artists so much. I want all of them to receive what's due to them. I don't feel the slightest bit sorry for her. All of those actions were all her own decision, and she did everything she could to end up with that kind of karma. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.